we decided, it was funny, I was watching a, a program about David Bowie and somebody was saying, you know, there's so many fans that do anything just to be near David Bowie. What would happen if he became political and told them, had ideas and tried to get them to follow him and actually told them what he would like them to be like? And we thought, that's an interesting idea. Why don't we do that and see what happens? Why don't we start our own little movement and actually deliberately play with that and just see how far it could go? So we decided to start the Temple of Psychic Youth. Instead of a fan club, we decided to have an anti-cult, a kind of neo-magical occult um, network. And we were very serious about trying to find ways to change how we felt and how we behaved. We had community houses all over England. Eventually, there were about 10,000 people actively involved over the world with different group centers in about eight, nine countries and sub-centers and people would go on um, trips into the desert and spend two or three weeks living communally and experimenting with rituals, whether they be Native American or Hindu, whatever, but just trying to find out more about how to relate to the world. In England, we basically picketed a dolphinarium in the town we lived in, in Brighton. Uh, it was a dolphinarium with two dolphins living in a tiny circular concrete pool that it made one and a half million pounds profit a year. But the dolphins, in fact, we discovered were, being, were dying from the terrible conditions and they would switch them for new dolphins and give them the same names so that the children going there didn't even know. So we picketed that every single Friday, Saturday and Sunday for one and a half years until we finally closed it down. All we did was ask people, please don't go inside. This is what's happening here. And we, we feel quite strongly that, that those people that ran the dolphinarium who were connected to conservative members of parliament probably triggered the attack on our house because we ruined a one and a half million a year business. I mean, I'm not surprised they were angry, but we even got the dolphins taken to the Turks and Caicos Islands by a charity and rehabilitated and set free. So we did everything kosher. In fact, um, oh God, what's his name? Julian Cope. He helped with it too, and Captain Sensible helped with it. You know, we had a lot of people. We did special events and benefits and so on. So we got quite a lot of people involved. And I think that was just one of many things that, that made me a target for the status quo for the establishment. You know, I was giving speeches against apartheid. Uh, we were doing benefits for squatters' rights. We were doing benefits for gay rights and so on. So it was kind of almost like a slot machine where there were all these different wheels and they all were things that the government didn't like, all these different issues. And when they pulled the, the arm down, it went click, 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 and it was all my name, you know. Everything they didn't like, I was involved. They were like, okay, we'll get that one. So that's really how it was. It was, a, it was a lifestyle attack and they thought if they attacked me uh, that it would somehow destroy the impetus of what we were trying to do, which of course it did to some degree. I lost two houses, I lost a record label, I lost everything overnight. Literally just had nothing overnight. I was told by my lawyers I couldn't go back to England and had two children. It was ironic because I was actually in Kathmandu with all the royalties from a year of psychic TV records uh, financing soup kitchens for Tibetan refugees, lepers and beggars in, in Kathmandu every single morning all through the winter so that they wouldn't die of starvation. So there I was doing good work whilst they were calling me the most evil person in Great Britain and I couldn't go home. It was a very weird moment. So but not, not atypical. It's kind of like the 60s over and over again, you know. Yeah. They, 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 the authorities are not stupid. They understand not why you're a threat, but that you are a threat. You know, they, they always pick on something that's not really relevant as why they're angry at you. And yet, they know that there's something about you that's subversive. And in a way, that's true for everybody. Anybody who uses their imagination or refuses to just follow the line that they're 
their family and, and friends expect. Anybody who, who doesn't do that is a threat to the people who've surrendered. You know, it makes them uncomfortable that you've not chosen to surrender. It makes them angry that you're prepared to fight to be different, to fight to be true to yourself. And so it's just the same thing on a bigger scale for me. You know, I made more people angry because I was prepared to refuse to do things the way they would like. And, and that is really the source of a lot of fear for people who've already given up hope for their life. There's two kinds of people in the world, the ones who give up hope very quickly and the ones who still dream of being different and doing something special. I got this fax when I was in Kathmandu and it said, there's trouble at home, don't come back. So I then went, had those days you had to walk back into the middle of Kathmandu just to phone home, so I went back, phoned, found out what was going on, went back to my hotel room and thought, now what happens, you know? <laughs> uh, I went and saw a Tibetan Rinpoche that I was working with and through a translator said, you know what, I'm in exile now too. And we both laughed. And I said, what should I do? And he said, go to America. I said, I don't want to go to America. I don't want to go to America. Why, why America? So I, I kind of cheated and went and saw a Hindu holy man, the Aguri Baba, and said, where should I go? <laughs> And he said, America. <laughs> Which I thought, oh shit, no, not America. <sighs> so I went back and I was sitting there and I was looking around and I noticed this envelope. And when I'd been leaving England, I just grabbed the mail from by the door, thrown it in a bag and forgotten about it. So I'm looking through this envelope with these different letters in, thinking what to do, what to do, America. Ooh. And then I saw this letter that looked, I thought, I don't recognize that name, Michael Horowitz. Hmm. So I opened it up and there's a postcard inside and it said, Dear Genesis, we were in England when you played at uh, Dingwalls. It was the most psychedelic thing we've seen since the acid test in 1966. I thought, what? Right. Um, and it, it was Michael Horowitz. Cindy Palmer and Winona Ryder. I'm not sure who else was there, but I remembered that we'd met Michael once through those Mondo 2000 people that I showed in the magazines in California. And he'd introduced us to Terence McKenna. So I knew who it was through that. And it, then it said, which was really interesting, it said, if you ever need a refuge, call this number. Isn't that amazing? This was six months or more after I'd left England that I had finally opened this letter on that very day. So I thought, well, I need a refuge. Okay, went back into town, rang him up. I said, Michael? He goes, yeah. I said, it's Genesis. I need a refuge. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, get, get to uh, San Francisco, we'll pick you up, and then you can stay with us. I said, all right. And so I, then I rang up Wax Tracks, who was our label at the time. I said, I need tickets for me and the children to get to America. So they said, OK. So lo and behold, the next thing I knew, there I was in San Francisco with the kids and living in Winona Ryder's old bedroom. Because that's who her parents were, it turned out. And then, of course, I didn't know it at the first, but Michael Horowitz, to this day, still takes care of the Timothy Leary archives. So one day I'm in the house and he says, Jen, Jen, there's someone who wants to speak to you on the phone. Hello, and he goes, hi, Genesis, it's Timothy Leary. I love your music. You've got to come and see me in LA. Come on, down. Ah. So I said, all right. So then he, they gave me a car that used to belong to Timothy Leary, and the number was High Orbit. And I drove down to LA, and I started to work with Timothy Leary, doing videos and sound for him when he did his special lectures and things. And just kept going. It was very nice the way it all just slotted together though, it was quite remarkable.